This morning's platform is titled, A Good Life, and our speaker is Dr. Richard Corll. Richard Corll is a leading leader in training in his second year of part-time internship. Last year, he served his first year of internship with the Ethical Culture Society of Bergen County in New Jersey, working with Dr. Joseph Schumann. Richard is a longtime member of the Ethical Culture Society of Westchester. He has been active on its board and served as its president in the late 90s and early aughts. He was also active with the American Ethical Union, serving on its board and was its president from 2012 to 2015. Richard has been engaged in leadership training for several years, in the course of which he has studied at the Humanist Institute, and he obtained a Doctor of Minister degree from the Hebrew Union College Interfaith Pastoral Counseling Program here in New York. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Richard Corll. Well, hello everybody. Good morning. It's another lovely summer day, and uh, we should appreciate it because uh, the days are getting shorter now and the nights are getting longer. Winter's going to come, but we're going to talk today about the good life. I think that's what we're all looking for, right? Uh, but what is it? Would we know it if we saw it? And would we even be satisfied with it once we achieved it? Maybe we had it all along and we didn't realize it. And uh, the question would be, did we waste it all away while chasing chimeras or other unrealistic dreams? A check on Amazon.com reveals countless titles that include some form of the expression, the good life. They're how-to books, self-help books, fiction, mysteries, some are doubtlessly using it in tongue in cheek. There are names of places called the good life, mostly bars, restaurants, and spas. Dr. Oz has a magazine called the good life, and it's filled with all sorts of advice on how to attain it. Clearly, the good life is everybody's aspiration. It is likely that there is many ideals for just what the good life might be as there are people. What makes a fulfilling life is subjective and personal, obviously. Psychologist Eric Erickson also once wrote that it's culturally defined. One community would create boundaries and channels to define what is ideal, what's appropriate, and what is taboo. Another community would encourage something different for what an ideal way to be. But even within one's own world, there are many paths to follow in the galaxy of possibilities concerning how to live one's life. Whether it's a young person just starting out, an older person assessing his or her life trajectory, or someone in the middle who has an urge to recalibrate and redirect themselves, the question should be posed. What is the best way to be in this life? What is the best life to live? Well, self-help guru James Altucher, who I don't know, but I heard him quoted to say that if you don't choose the life you want to live, chances are someone else is going to choose it for you. But we should also ask whether this is really a realistic question at all. In fact, most people don't have an opportunity to make a choice about the kind of life that they intend to lead. Most people just barrel their way through life. They're pressured by demands, impelled to find immediate answers to practical challenges, uh, and they're confronted in the here and now with choices to make. And then they find themselves way down the road before they have the opportunity to reflect, to reflect on where they should have been headed instead. Then again, for hundreds of millions of people in this world who live on $2 a day or less, the challenge of bare subsistence occupies all their time. The suggestion of kicking back and considering an idea about what the good life would be seems cynical or absurd. Viktor Frankl, the philosopher and Holocaust survivor, uh, said that philosophy can only begin after one's basic 
survival needs are fulfilled. Who can think of abstractions when your harsh realities are so demanding? Well, where is that level? Last year at the National uh, Annual AU Assembly, one of the speakers was woman Miriam Tatzell, a psychology professor who did research in positive psychology and uh, consumer behavior. She had recently written a piece explaining that if consumers would consume less, they would be happier and they would benefit the environment too. Her message was that by simplifying one's life, it would benefit oneself as well as the environment, a win-win situation for everybody. Well, there was an amazing pushback by the people who attended the program. And it's very interesting to watch. People argued that there was no way that they could cut back from the consumption that they were engaged in. People were expressing a deep anxiety about how they needed to spend this or that in order to maintain their standing or fulfill expectations imposed on them or maybe to assure their survival. People were stuck in their life paths. Now, I thought of it as a desperate display of a kind of middle-class anxiety. People revealed a frightening insecurity about maintaining their hold on things, and they were really not capable of imagining a simplification of their lives. They felt that they, uh, they themselves were on the edge of subsistence. Now, Professor Tatzell wrote elsewhere uh, about this Victor Frankl syndrome, let's call it, or maybe the Victor Frankl hole. If you're too poor, then you're too insecure and too concerned with basic survival to be able to look up and philosophize. You're stuck in a Victor Frankl hole. So what then is enough income, enough consumption, before one will feel secure enough to be able to stop and look up from the grindstone? There seems to be a component of wealth to this uh, imagining a good life. There has to be enough to meet basic needs. For some, it's enough to have the sun in the morning and the moon at night, right? But not everybody. Professor Tatzel undertook to measure with uh, surveys what, in our society, someone needs to earn in order to reach that threshold. Is there a point where the sense of satisfaction stops growing with increased income. So for every additional dollar earned, you feel happier. But it starts to level off at a certain point. And she found that that satisfaction rose with higher income until about $75,000 a year, which is above median income, but not a lot higher. She found that beyond that point, a sense of fulfillment did not improve anymore with any more increased income. So I wonder if the anxiety that people were expressing that day never actually abated with higher income, actually. So we're always uncomfortable. We're always insecure. But at least it levels off at some number, like 75,000. There's another group that has persistent anxiety, and those are many millennials today. They came of age in the Great Recession, and many have a powerful sense of insecurity and the very effinescence of uh, planning. Here you have some people with a ton of student loans, loans that were taken out at an expectation of what the future should hold for them, uh, but are working in unfulfilling jobs or in low-paying jobs. They rely on their resilience and flexibility more than a life plan. So for many people, life plan is an abstract notion. Of course, throughout the world and all through human history, people were forced to improvise, compromise, make the best of what the world served up to them. But then from time to time, still, one must stop and reflect and look at our lives and ask, is this a life of meaning? Is it a good life? Is there a change I should be making? So let's go on and design a good life. There's what Frank Sinatra sang about, remember? It's the good life, full of fun. Seems to be the ideal. At the outset, I'd like to suggest there are two models for a good life. There is a life that is enviable, and there is a life that is admirable. These both seem to be positive uh, models for a person to follow, but they do answer to different ideals. 
An enviable life might be one of ease and wealth, and who wouldn't want that? I imagine that to be the Donald Trump ideal. The life of winners, not losers. People who have steak for dinner every night, jet around the world, and sip champagne at his Mar-a-Lago club in Florida. That's an enviable life to many people. But an enviable life could also be a life of adventure and discovery. Who wouldn't want to be someone like Richard Branson, a super successful entrepreneur who will go into space in his own rocket ship? He has an enviable, exciting life of adventure and success. There are also the lives of people who make great discoveries, Nobel Prize winners, or say, a Benjamin Franklin, statesman, businessman, scientist, diplomat. These are lives others look upon with envy. Someone might try to emulate such a life of accomplishment and success. Then there's someone like Abraham Lincoln. He accomplished so much in his life. As president, he held the nation together, emancipated the slaves, promoted development of the West. At the same time, though, he lived a life of troubles. He battled depression, saw his child die, his wife de descend into mental illness. He showed resolve and bore, but he bore burdens of regret and horror in the great civil war that consumed his presidency. And of course, at the age of 53, he was gunned down. His life was admirable for the accomplishments he achieved, but there is something in the nature of that life story that we don't really envy. That's not a life that many of us would uh, knowingly choose for ourselves. And there are many stories of great men and women who sacrificed and dedicated themselves to great causes. We admire their impact and their accomplishments, their devotion, their dedication to their causes. But we don't necessarily envy their experience. Their lives were admirable, but not necessarily enviable. One factor that may distinguish admirable lives is the way they tend to be devoted to others. There is self-sacrifice, and these sacrifices are made to serve higher goals rather than personal gains. The debate about what makes a good life has developed along two independent streams. There's the philosophical tradition, going back to the Greeks who debated endlessly on this question. And then in recent years, there's been an emerging branch of psychology called positive psychology, uh, which uh, questions, uh, raises this question from a totally different perspective. So let's look at the philosophers just for a moment. The first recorded debate over what kind of life should serve as the model for a good life uh, took place among the Greeks, of course. Aristotle made much of the same distinction that we're making uh, between two kinds of happiness. Happiness that is to be praised, he wrote, and happiness that's to be prized. In his writings, he used the Greek word eudaimonia, which has been translated as happiness. Uh, but more recently, though, it's been, there's been a consensus to translate it into human well-being. So it's a little bit deeper than simple happiness. So his project was how to achieve a deeper human well-being. In today's positive psychology and happiness studies, the debate also turned to the question of promoting well-being rather than simply happiness, as it uh, first had been framed when the studies emerged. So in his Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle explored the factors that promote human well-being, and he took a kind of balanced approach. On the one hand, he said, one should cultivate one's virtues, and the Greeks defined virtues as one's internal characteristics, one's excellences, such as skills and attributes. So one should develop oneself to be the best one can be with respect to one's most appropriate talents and vocations. So he would say this, these excellence must be expressed in the context of action. So one's competencies must be directed to practical, appropriate functions in the society, meaning Eudaimonia requires one to be fully engaged 
using your, uh, in the intellectually stimulating and fulfilling work using your skills and talents and achieving a well-earned success. So being fully actualized as a competent professional is the feature of a good and fulfilled life, according to Aristotle. But he also recognized the external attributes as well, uh, such as uh, wealth and fame. These are things we tend to identify with the enviable life. He believed that a good life would have both aspects. So ideally, a Bill Gates would be his model. He used his talents and he achieved success. In contrast, others like Plato would have said, believing that all you really needed were the virtues themselves. So all that external stuff is superfluous and distracting. That's like the Ralph Nader lifestyle. You're devoted to your mission, and you forego all pleasures in life. Now, the Stoics built on Plato's view, and he argued that as long as, they argued that as, long as your internal core was sturdy, you could endure with equanimity the slings and arrows of harsh externalities. Stoicism emphasizes personal attributes like honesty, moderation, simplicity, self-discipline. They made the claim that the eudaimonic life was the morally virtuous life. <clears throat> Moral virtue is all that's good, and everything else, such as health or honor or wealth, they're merely neutral, take it or leave it. So I suppose you could just as well go live in a prison as long as you knew for certainty that you were right all along. Now Epicurus made a career out of exploring this question. And for him, the standard guide is pleasure. But he defined it really as a state of, in Greek, ataraxia, meaning tranquility of soul or imperturbability. So that's an even, steady, unperturbed life would make the good life. Does that mean a career in the post office? In his estimation, pleasure was the absence of pain. One could imagine the Buddhist view about attachments being similar, analogous, and how the goal to transcend your attachments and achieve a balanced, a kind of neutral equanimity is similar. Well, what characterized the ancient philosophers was their propensity to sit back and imagine what ought to be a good life. Uh, from their uh, untethered musings, they invented rules and guides for people to follow in order to be happy in the abstract. In contrast, positive psychology takes the question from a different perspective and seeks to discover what actually makes people happy. Uh, these writers have distilled it down to all kinds of lists of factors that comprise a good life. I've seen lists of six factors, lists of 26 factors. It's a lot of boxes to check in order to feel happy. There's a lot of pressure involved in there to find that you've been satisfied. Uh, but there's one thing that most seem to agree on. Researchers find deeper and richer satisfaction in people's lives, not from material rewards at all but rather from enriching personal ex relationships. This may not be so surprising since it's the moral of every novel and the uh, theme of every sermon, but it appears to be remarkably true in the analysis of populations. For example, there's the Harvard study of adult development. Talk about longitudinal studies. It was a 75-year study starting in 1938 with 724 men. Half of them were Harvard students, and half were young men from inner, inner city Boston. The clear finding, hands down finding, was that good relationships keep people happier and healthier. There was no other factor in people's lives that correlated as strongly. So these subjects those subjects who were more socially connected to family, friends, community, were indeed happier, physically healthier, and lived longer than those who were less well connected. It found that the quality of relationships is also important. For example, a high degree of conflict in marriage was shown to be bad for your health. 
having a warm relationship is protective for your health. Those reporting happy relationships at age 50 were actually healthier at age 80. So it seems that the most important factor of a good life is one in which strong relationships are built. So Ebenezer Scrooge from Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol, that's a wonderful humanist story. It has nothing to do with Christmas. You know, it's, a, um, it's a good case in point in this respect. Ebenezer Scrooge built a career that was financially quite successful. But along the way, he shed relationships, right? Uh, instead of cultivating them. He abandoned his fiancée as a young man and devoted himself to work. He rejected his nephew's social invitations. Only in the end, after his brief visit to Christmas's future, does he realize that his own well-being depends on the cultivation of relationships and showing concern for others. So all work and no play does work worse than make Jack a dull boy. It undermines his social integration, his health, and his life expectancy. So how does this contribute to someone's career planning? In our culture, we tend to admire one model too much. People who knuckle down and work unreasonable hours to realize an abstract dream, building a business, achieving tenure, making partner. In many professions, a balanced life is not rewarded. Paid family leave time remains controversial in our country. Does one have to be especially brave enough to forego traditional success in order to construct a life that works well? Does one have to forego expensive quality purchases, such as, say, private school or for your kids or a home in a top school district, in order to leave time, instead of leaving time to relate to your kids directly? or brand name universities? So these are not really easy questions, even for those with the opportunity to make a choice. Well, let's look at some of the factors that comprise a good life that some of the positive psychologists have enumerated. The psychologist Carol Riff of the University of Wisconsin conceptualized eudaimonia as a six-factor structure. And it's a widely quoted uh, and re referenced uh, structure uh, by other writers. And our challenge would be to design a life that can fulfill as many of these factors as possible. Okay, there are six. Number one, we'll start with the positive relations with others, which we've been talking about. That's certainly there, the number one. We are social animals, as we continually remind ourselves. Isolation is for humans the greatest torture. Iso uh, shunning, abandonment, solitary confinement, to be a stranger alone and unknown, these are some of the saddest conditions a person might endure. A person needs to have a community of people to which he or she belongs. To have a minimum number of friends, people who understand you or simply hear you, this is a necessity for a good life. Beyond that, a person will only flourish when living and working in close cooperation with others. So a life that cultivates rich relationships is important. Number two, she lists autonomy. So what's autonomy? Successful individuation, uh, self-direction, self-reliance. Uh, being responsible for oneself is empowering. Or as the psychologist uh, Kohlberg describes it, it's characterized by rational judgment derived from a conscious recognition of the value of the individual inside an organized society. That's to say, one's conscious of the role one plays and seeing oneself as a freestanding member of a community. Personal growth. Making space for opportunities to grow and develop across the years of life. We're like the trees. We continue to grow until we die. An atmosphere of stultification and ritualistic old habits restrains growth, while an openness to new experiences, new knowledge, new people enlivens and enriches us. Four, self-acceptance. We're all self-critical. 
having aspirations and goals mean we're unsatisfied with the present in some way, but we can still accept oneself and the role we occupy and be at peace with who, they, who we are. Lao Tzu is quoted as saying this, because one believes in oneself, one doesn't try to convince others. Because one is content with oneself, one doesn't need others' approval. Because one accepts oneself, the whole world accepts him or her. One can imagine the pessimistic rabbit hole someone falls through when he or she is overly self-critical, or the burdens we assume when we continually look to others for approval. But permit yourself to be acceptable and adequate for the journey. You can then dare to look beyond yourself. E. E. Cummings once wrote, once we believe in ourselves, we can risk curiosity, wonder, spontaneous delight, or any experience that reveals the human spirit. Fifth, she lists environmental mastery, by which I think she means the capacity to manage effectively one's life and the surrounding world, to, to negotiate the world, to be organized enough to meet common standards of habitation, nutrition, to deal effectively enough with society to assure your own safety, freedom, and control. And the last one, number six, I guess is really the most interesting and most difficult one. And that's to have a purpose in life. What is a purpose in life? It can be any purpose, plan, goal, project. People who are made to work at something. Felix Adler wrote, activity is the aim of life and the joy of working for large ends. Striving is not simply for momentary good, but to win fine self-expression. Viktor Frankl, who we've mentioned before, emphasized that one should seek value in three main areas, the creative, experiential, and attitudinal. In other words, there is a broad spectrum of interests and experiences that people can find themselves engaged in and find purpose in. But without a goal, a person has no bearings. There's no north, no south. There's no forward, no back. With a goal, you can know where you're headed. Here we can say that a purpose which fulfills an ethical pursuit is the one that's most fulfilling in the long run. As Felix Adler, again, said, living consists of influencing others. To develop one's own life means to extend one's influence on others. Spiritual life is provoking into activity what was only potential in someone else. And further, he said, the question of paramount importance, therefore, is to be kept ever before the mind is this, how am I influencing others? How, for example, as an employer, am I influencing my employees? How, as a citizen, am I influencing my fellow citizens? Am I supremely interested in getting the best from people with whom I am in touch? Am I helping them to make the most of themselves? So notice, that the features of a good life, as we described it, did not measure accomplishments at all. A good life, per se, is not better for the greater accomplishments. A sense of fulfillment depends more on the attitude, not the work or the gains. The worth and the value of your accomplishments will be judged, I suppose, by posterity. The standards concentrate not on the possessions one has, but on the attachments one makes. They concentrate on the people loved, not the people ruled or managed. The sum total of the discussion, I think, is that the life we live is really our own to control more than we usually allow. So long as we ris resist the criticism of others, uh, the tempting examples and the blandishments of people who are themselves on the wrong track, as we said, autonomy is the factor that gives us independence and backbone and confidence that our lives are measured by our own standards. Solzhenitsyn wrote that it's not the standard of living that makes us happy, 
It's the way we feel, the way we look at life. Both of these things are always within our own power. And hence a person is always happy if he wants to be, and no one can stop him. Thanks a lot.